Good afternoon. Welcome to our winter camp here on this beautiful afternoon here at Racing Magpie. Um, my name is Peter Strong. I'm co-director at Racing Magpie, and I just want to welcome everyone here that's live, as well as the folks who are joining us on Facebook live stream uh, as well. Um, winter camp, just as a quick introduction, winter camp is intended as a, a program to create space for all of the brilliance and creative knowledge that's in the, the Lakota community and a place for that to be shared and, and gathered and um, enjoyed by people around the world, um, both now live and uh, for those who go to our YouTube page or our Facebook videos page and, and view them down the road. It's just meant as a resource for all of us to continue to build relationships with each other through the arts and through cultural knowledge. So um, today we have Tasaniki Crazy Bowl here. Um, we're really excited to have her here to teach about bringing the stars to you, finding and making community. And uh, without any further delay, I'm gonna hand it over to her. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for having me uh, with the Racing Magpie uh, Winter Camp Series. Let me share my screen here so everybody can see uh, my presentation. Let's see. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk about my time moving around and um, finding and making community, uh, finding people, finding other artists, and finding friends. Um, I spent my adult life moving around. Um, I'm from Rosebud, South Dakota. I grew up, uh, I was born when my parents were in college and I grew up in Rosebud. And then when I got married, I spent my entire adult life so far moving around the United States. And uh, we've lived in four countries, uh, four other countries as well because of my husband's military service. Um, and so I raised my kids kind of all over the place. Um, and one of the things that I had to do was really learn how to um, find people, find other artists because I am an artist and because I wanted to maintain that, those ties, not only to my community and my culture um, at home, but to be able to try to find that and make sure I shared that with my kids. So on the screen here, you see my kids, two of my, um, two of my older kids are uh, attending the Institute of American Indian Arts and then my youngest is in middle school. Um, and so we, we had a quick visit with them. Um, recently. So, like I said, um, I um, was a military spouse. My husband recently retired from the Navy after uh, just about 25 years. And so we spent the past 10 years living overseas. Um, we lived around the United States for those first, like, I can't remember. We weren't married right away, but uh, maybe 10 years um, living around the United States. And then the past 10 years living overseas, um, we lived in France, we lived in Italy, we lived in Ghana, West Africa, and we lived in Germany. And we recently moved back to the state for currently living in Montana. And so what you have here on the screen is um, one of the shots outside of my window of our apartment in France. Um, and then you also see my sewing machine set up. I traveled with my sewing machine, um, you know, flying to France. My sewing machine was one of my pieces of luggage. And so um, I knew that I wanted to take it with me and, and be able to have that as something to do. Um, my kids were pretty little at the time and um, they went to school. Living in France, um, my youngest was only three. And I know that we have you know early head start in the United States. I didn't experience that with my older kids when we lived in the States. And um, I experienced that when we got to France. Um, my youngest son was able to go to school even though he was only three. He went to a French preschool. He didn't speak the language. None of my kids spoke the language, um, but he's he learned very quickly. The older kids learned very quickly how to speak French. Um, and so I, that year, got to be the probably the most prolific of my life thus far. Um, and I made about 20 or 22 quilts that year. I know a lot of people make more than that. A lot of people, you know, we sell a lot. I know people who sell them um, for an income. This is their job and uh, you, you can make more. But that was the first time I was able to sew as much as I could. Um, and I used my time living overseas to be able to expand not only my sewing skills, but my friendships, my relationships, um, and the 
you know, really worked even harder to maintain my cultural ties because my kids were not close to any of our family. Um, so on the next screen here, I'm going to show you, this is the um, podcast rankings. <laughs> um, I had a podcast, you see me at number 14 right there with me being crafty. Um, I had a podcast for two years while we lived in France, and this was just another way that I reached out, um, met people, interviewed them about specifically about quilting. Um, the Modern Quilt Movement started, the Modern Quilt Guild, excuse me, was founded in 2009. Um, and so that movement of modern quilting is pretty new. Um, and at the time, there were not very many podcasts. There were not uh, many people talking about things like that. So it was really fun. I did a podcast for two years and I ended up having to quit because when we moved to Italy, we had no internet service at our house for four months. So living overseas is fun and games until you don't have any internet service. <laughs> um, one of the things that living, moving to France, the first place that we moved to, did for me, as I said, I was able to really make so many quilts because all of my kids were in school um, and, and they were not at home. I was by myself, my husband worked, my husband was deployed. Um, and so here are a couple of mini quilts. Um, I know that Peter is gonna be showing some of the quilts that I bought here in person and I'll be talking about those more as well. But um, if you're new to quilting, new to sewing, um, you know, feel free to ask any questions and maybe I can uh, make sure I can answer them in a good way for you. But this is the binding of the mini quilts and these are just some different kind of, um, not, spe yeah, specialty stitches that you can use to close that off. And so what I did with my time in France and continuing on, um, you know, over the past 10 years was really try to expand my knowledge of quilting, trying new things, trying new techniques, learning new quilt patterns, and designing my own quilt patterns as well. Um, you know, I know for Lakota people, we make star quilts for everything and anything. Um, and I really wanted to try to learn more and, and be able to share that with my friends and family and my kids and stuff like that. So um, the, the other thing that the online movement, the modern quilt movement did is um, gave me access to people who, we're interested in connecting in through this, through quilting. Um, and so I participated in a lot of swaps. I did um, mini quilts. On the left, you see a mini quilt and a pin cushion. And then on the right is a quilt block. Um, these were both swaps that I did. The block was sent to somebody who, they sent me the fabric and they said, this is what I want you to make. And we all made what that person wanted. And then at the end, they got, you know, six or eight or 10. You don't keep your group too big, but that was just another way for us to stay connected, even though we didn't live around anybody. When we were living in France, <clears throat> excuse me, we knew probably three or four other American families. Um, everybody else was French. My husband was stationed with the French military. And so um, we were really on our own. And so the, the online world, uh, quilting wise, the online world was really a big help for me. Um, I did find people in person. I bought a European um, electricity, uh, 220 volt, the electricity for Europe's uh, sewing machine because I blew my sewing machine up. So <laughs> I had to replace it because really I sew every single day. Um, and I plugged, I was so excited to, I'm so excited we have an apartment. Let's take my sewing machine from the hotel. I can actually plug it in. I made the mistake of plugging it in and it blew up. And <laughs> um, the sewing machine store was actually right next to my youngest son's school. And I walked by every single day and looked in the window. <laughs> um, and so, you know, having that resource for me really helped when you're not, when you're not living around anybody that you know, when you're trying to find new people, when you're trying to find relationships and, um, you know, people to be friends, other artists to be friends. So here's a couple more minis that I made. Um, these again were also swaps. People would tell you like maybe what color they wanted or they would have a specific um, request or, you know, I want something um, paper piece. So the one on the left there you see that is paper piece. When you literally sew on or write near paper, um, I can demonstrate that um, later on. Um, I made quilt blocks. I made um, things for friends as well. You know, this is just another way for us to stay connected. Um, I have a group of probably five or six girlfriends that I've been friends with for probably coming up on 15 years or so now. And um, she is, I'm going to mess up what she does. I'm sorry, I don't know. She has a PhD in chemistry, I think. But she, at the time, was working with 
she was doing research around volcanoes and I made a mini quilt, um, a mini art quilt, this would be called um, for her. And it looks like a photo that she took. Um, on the right, if you are somebody who purchases fabric, you know, you purchase it for anything, even if it's solid fabric, you're gonna have a salvage, right? So you're gonna have that bottom edge on each side, the top and the bottom. If you have printed fabric, you're gonna be able to, uh, well, you could do it with solid fabric too, but printed fabric, it looks really nice be able to cut this up like uh, in a strip. We want to make it maybe an inch or inch and a half. And then you can sew it. And this is called a, a salvage string. And so you can have blocks that are just the salvages. You would sew this on paper that you tear away, or you could sew it on maybe like a muslin um, or, a, or a fabric that you're not going to use for something else. And so you can really use every single piece of your fabric. Um, the thing that I did also continue to do, excuse me, is um, work with quilting and sewing as a portable uh, as a portable art. And this is another way to meet people, to make friends, and to find people who um, like to do what you do. They're going to have questions. They might have questions. This is my youngest playing at the playground when we lived in France. Um, I would take my sewing to the playground. And he would play and I would sew. And I probably met three or four people. Um, unfortunately, I don't speak fluent French the way my kids learn to, but um, I spoke to them well enough. And a lot of French people speak English um, in our experience. And so the, on the left is called paper piecing, which is sewing around kind of thicker pieces of paper. You don't sew through the paper, but you use the paper as um, the design. And then on the right, I'm finishing up binding. I don't remember if that one ended up being a quilt or something smaller, um, but that one is just finishing up some binding. Uh, and then again, we have some quilt blocks on the left. And the thing that I wanted to make sure to do was, I learned how to do star quilts right away. Um, you know, I've been sewing since I was a little girl. I was probably, I don't know, four or five, maybe even younger than that. And, you know, like we all do, or like a lot of us do, I learned how to sew um, by sitting with my grandma and my mom. And um, I learned how to make star quilts when I was probably in my early 20s. And I started really sewing a lot more at that point um, when I had my, um, when I started having kids. And my mom said, you know, it's time to make quilts, make the baby a quilt. Um, and so on the left, you have some quilt blocks that were from a bee that I did. I mentioned, you know, telling people what your design is and then they would make everything for you. Um, and so these are designs that I got back from other people. And then on the right is a baby quilt. Um, I think that one of the nice things about quilting is that you can find a pattern that looks complicated, um, but once you break down the, the, the instruction of this, it's not complicated at all. Um, and so you're able to kind of branch out and really give people uh, meaningful gifts that um, will last a really long time. Again, we have another baby quilt. Um, this one on the left, actually, the one on the left and the one that you just saw both went to the same family. I went to my brother-in-law um, and he ended up, uh, him and his wife have two boys. And so I passed those along to them. The quilt on the right is one that I made for my son's teacher when we left France. Um, I asked her, I asked other parents, other parents helped me find the height of all the kids in the class and ask the kids their favorite color. And so you can see little, maybe like pink sticky notes. Um, that is referencing the kids' names. That was just for me. I didn't leave that on there because it's paper. But I ended up finishing that quilt and quilting and giving it to the teacher. Um, at the same time, we were leaving France. And so that was kind of like our going away, you know, thank you for, thank you for being the teacher. Thank you for helping him during this time because by the time we left, my kids all spoke fluent French. Um, so that was really nice, um, you know, good skill for them to have. Um, the other thing that, of course, we do as Lakota people is um, we make, like I said, we make star quotes for everything and anything. And these are the star quotes that my mom and myself made when um, one of my brothers and I named most of our kids. I named all my kids and he named six of his. <laughs> um, and so this is a photo of those. And I do, um, I will talk about these a little bit further um, as I talk a little bit about color um, when you're quilting and kind of picking, um, you know, picking out colors for things. Um, after France, we moved to Italy and I have a new setup here for how I'm sewing. I always wonder 
that's one of my, the biggest things I think about when I move to a new place is I need to make sure I can have a spot to sew. Am I going to have a place that has good lighting? Is it going to be, um, am I going to have a spot to put my sewing table? Or am I going to have to sit at the dining table? I know a lot of us sit at our dining tables. Um, I did that for quite a long time. And then again, learning a new technique, learning something new, trying to find out something new. Um, this was lettering, putting letters into mini quilts. There's all kinds of alphabets you can find now um, online. Some are free and some are paid, but um, the, the value is there. If you're looking for something like this, you can, you can put all, any kind of, all kinds of letters and, you know, into a quilt. Um, and, you know, the value of sharing on social media, it's really easy to do if you just stop for a minute and take pictures. When we lived in Italy, we had this really great balcony that had a nice view on pretty much all sides. Um, we had this, we had a tree, we had a, vision, a view of the valley, and we had a view of the ocean on the other side. So, um, you know, we had a really nice time taking photos. And so um, if we get into kind of talking about specifically quilting and talking about color and picking out color, this is the star quilt that I made. Um, these are all batik fabrics. Uh, batik is cotton. It's just a, it's a way that fabric is made. Um, batiks are a little bit stiffer depending on where you buy them. I think it's like the, how they finish it. And so here is how I decided to lay out my fabrics and my colors for the star quilt. And, you know, we all know that how you lay them out is going to change how the, the star quilt looks. So here's the progression of that where I tested out the background. Um, I think the blue probably would have looked nice. You know, the, I didn't really care for the red. I don't think that any of the other fabrics really have a tone that goes with that red. Um, but the blue probably would have looked really nice. If you look, I actually picked the brown. Um, I picked the dark brown and the points almost kind of get lost. And it almost, maybe the inner, that full circle ring sort of blends into it. So, you know, you, we all kind of have to, you think about that whenever you're picking your colors out and you, you try to decide what colors this is. I'm gonna show you a couple of mistakes that I made, or I think they're mistakes. Of course, the, the star quilt still looks beautiful, right? So here's a star quilt that I made for one of my nieces when she graduated high school. Um, I have the, the, the picture on the left is um, a piece of batting that I hung up on the wall because batting is, it's not sticky, but it's fleece. And so the fabric will kind of stick to it. And so I have, I hang it up on the wall just to see what is it gonna look like? Um, do I want to turn anything around? It's nice to be able to see that. And then you see the finished star quilt on the other side. The gray, it's a gray background and it has the purple um, points. They kind of almost, they kind of almost fade away. You almost don't see them. Uh, would they have looked better with a different color? You know, too late now. We made it. It looks beautiful. Um, but I, the thing that I actually wanted to talk about is the pink. So here's a zoomed in one. I hope everybody can see that. Um, I don't know if you can, I think you can see it pretty well in person here as well. You can see that those pinks are two different fabrics. And so when you're quilting, you might think, I thought clearly, you know, I thought, oh, this is going to look really good. I really like these colors together. And then as you are sewing, as you're progressing through this, I didn't realize how similar it looked from far away. Um, and so it still looks really nice. It still looks really good. But, you know, thinking about stuff like that whenever we quilt, that's something that I um, try to pay more attention to as, I, as I've gone along farther in my quilting. Um, this one, in this dark quilt is actually one of the quilts that was um, we used in the naming. This is the one that I used and gave to um, the woman who named my daughter. Uh, this quilt has almost the same kind of issue that the previous quilt has with the pinks kind of blending together, but it looks nice. It's a solid and it's um, some prints and other colors. And um, this quilt is actually in this book called Quilted, which is a series in our a book in a series of encyclopedias that somebody made. Um, the magazine is called Uppercase, and then the publisher is publishing a whole uh, series of encyclopedias, and this is Q, so Q for quilted. Um, and so you see the photo on the left is my son holding the quilt up. And, um, you know, it, it does kind of all blend together. It looks nice, but it's certainly something I think about when I'm picking out quilts, uh, picking out colors to use for quilts. And I think that's really important for us to think about. So here's a baby quilt. This is a really good example of um, thinking about your color placement, your color choice. 
because these diamonds are simply flipped around. So you see in the photo on the left, the red is in the center, and on the photo on the right, the red are the points on the outside. I don't remember how I ended up sewing them. I know that it was a gift that's already been given away probably a few years ago now. Um, but you can see how drastically that changes the, the look of a quilt when you change your colors and you change just the placement of how things um, sit, in the, sit in the quilt. Here's another photo where um, I used, I think that this photo on the right, the star quilt, that actually ended up being a star quilt, but I wanted to see what it would look like if I just did an alternative layout. You know, we're all really used to doing star quilts. We all kind of, I think that's really like our default. Our default quilt is, oh, I'm gonna make a star quilt or I need to make a star quilt. Um, there's so many other ways you can lay that out. There's so many other ways that you can kind of play with those designs and get something new. Uh, in your in your patterns and these are this these are also the star quotes that we use for our naming um I think this was making sure that we had the right binding for each of them um because at the time I was living overseas still and um what I would do is anytime I was able to come home for something um we only came home a couple of times over those years unfortunately we had to, we came home for funerals but we came home in the summertime to visit and I would pack all of my quilt tops um, at the time, I was not really a fan of quilting. I felt like my sewing machine was kind of too small to do that. Um, and so I brought them back and um, my mom had a quilter and she would take them to the quilter and we would work with somebody to be able to um, get our star quilts finished. Um, if you're in person here, then there is some packets and I'll hold them up just so that if you're on Zoom, you can see um, what they are. These are pretty easy to find online. So we have a coloring sheet that has this, the star quilt. And then there's also another um, Lone Star Medallion book that actually has multiple color, um, excuse me, multiple sizes of star quilts. I'm not sure if my thing is picking this up, but this slide here, um, in person, we have some colored pencils and stuff that we'll do the activity with in a few minutes. But you can see then this slide here is, um, Fabric. This is my mom's picture because she likes to cut out fabric real tiny and uh, make her star quilts like this. And so she doesn't color on the page. She takes actual fabric pieces and puts them on there. And then this allows her to rearrange them. Maybe she actually doesn't like how it looks and she moves colors around or something like that. So I think that's really helpful. It just kind of depends on what you're interested in doing. Um, and how you know how you kind of think how you like to do stuff. There are computer programs out there as well that will help you um, with coloring in the star quilts. This one is a baby quilt that I designed. I designed this uh, several years ago. Um, I think I at the time, I'm not sure if I live, if I live in the states or not, but I wanted to show show this because the image on the left is just the block itself, and this is the large stuff. You know, this is like 40 inches by 40 inches. It's a pretty standard baby size quilt. Um, but on the left, it does not have the borders yet. So you can also see here. Not only color placement is important, but when you're working with you know different kinds of patterns or different different kinds of techniques, you also want to see. What is it going to look like if I change this? So if I add a border, what's it going to look like? If I take away the border, what is it going to look like? Um, baby quilts are often sized so that if you wanted to, you could make four of them and put them together and end up with, you know, a really large, like a king or queen size quilt. So it just depends on like what you're thinking of and how you want to process, how you want that quilt to come out looking in the end. Um, the next slide is the baby quilt is finished. And so you can kind of see the quilting on there. Um, my mom again. My mom's quilter did this one for me because, like I said, at the time I was not really a fan of quilting on my machine because I just felt like it was too small. Um, one of the things that I did because I learned to sew when I was so little, and because I, um, you know, we live far away from everybody and we move quite often, I wanted to make sure my kids knew how to sew. And so this is my youngest. Um, now he's in middle school, but I taught him how to sew when he was really little. He was. He was like five or six, I think, when I taught him how to sew on the machine. And because I had spent that money on that machine that I bought in France, you know, this is a European plugin. Um, I took really good care of it and I wanted him to know how to use it. And so I showed him how to use it really from changing the needle to changing the foot to changing the stitches, anything you can think of with the machine. He was little and he could do all of that. 
And I think that's really important that, you know, not only are our kids allowed to do that, but they're encouraged to do that. So he would get up, I would be doing something else and he'd say, I'm going to go sew. And I knew that because I taught him how to do it and I showed him the process that he was fine to go sew by himself. Um, so the start coat on the left, he sold that. Um, I pinned it for him, but he sold it. And if he messed up that quarter inch as a as a quilter, we sew, we sew with quarter inches. If you're a seamstress and you make clothing, it's usually bigger than that. It's like three eighths of an inch um, for the seam allowance. But quilters, we do quarter inch. And um, you know, I'm even tough on him. If he messed up the quarter inch, I made him take it out, and he had to do it over. So uh, you know, make sure that he learned the right way to do it. You have to make sure that you're. Um, you know, you have a good technique. If you have the good basic down, then you can really play around and learn and do more things. And then the quilt on the right, he also sewed that one. That was a lot easier because the Star, quilt, uh, the Star Wars characters you see in the middle was a panel. So it was one piece of fabric. So he didn't have too much sewing to do on that one. Um, I really encourage if you have kids, you know, then they, they can also learn how to sew and they can really enjoy it. Um, the next place that we lived after Italy was Ghana, West Africa. Um, and in Ghana, they have what's called wax fabric. Um, there's probably two or three different sources of it. I know that um, Holland, the country from Holland was a big source. Um, you know, from quite a long time ago, they brought fabric to West Africa, parts of West Africa, and then the Ghanaians and um, the surrounding country people kind of took over on it and made it their own, um, started printing fabric. We, when we lived in Ghana, we lived really close to a factory that printed fabric. Um, and then we also had the opportunity to make our own fabric, uh, Ghana and other parts of West Africa. But Ghana specifically is really known for hand dyed batik. Um, and so on the left is a lunchbox that I made with some Ghanaian wax fabric. Um, my son carried that, that one every day that we lived there when he went to school. And then on the right is fabric that I printed and I made. Um, I befriended a woman who owned um, her a store as well as a company, her own company that she had a, that worked out of her house. And so we did wax dyeing with um, blocks and she had the dye and she had, I don't even know how many hundreds of different stamps you could pick from to dye fabric. And so that was a really cool experience. Um, that was really fascinating to live in Ghana, to live amongst um, you know the, these Ghanaian women who really took ownership over this cultural aspect of their lives um, and really tied them all together because almost everybody did this or knew or you know knew somebody who did it. People often had their own like family stamps and stuff like that that was really and the, the, there's also designs that were only for their chiefs and, and things like that. So that was a really cool experience to have. And then um, here's a photo to show you of what one of the uh, shops looked like just packed from top to bottom, left to right of the main fabric. And it was really a cool place to be as somebody who sews. Um, that was really a great place to live because of having access to so much cool fabric. When we lived in Ghana, you know, there were times that I sewed at my sewing, at my uh, dining table. So here is my machine. By this time, I put stickers all over my machines. Um, all my sewing machines have all kinds of stickers. Um, if you're in person here, my laptop has stickers on it as well. And, you know, this is at our dining table sewing. And I know because the next pictures on my on my computer after this one are my husband is doing beadwork and my son is, I think he was playing a, a battleship. And so, you know, the dining table ends up being the center of everything. Um, and on the right here is an advent calendar that I made. And this one is a panel. Um, it is a mix of uh, machine sewing and hand stitching. I think I hand stitched um, just the detail that you can see kind of in between the in between the pockets there. Um, next up, uh, you know, I really, I learned to love quilting. Um, I learned to love quilting. The last place that we lived overseas was Germany. Um, and every place that I lived, I found people to sew and to quilt with. I found quilt guilds, I found friends. I just found people when I, you know, took my quilt to the soccer game when my kids were playing soccer. And I met people when I was doing my hand binding and stuff like that. Um, and by the time we got to Germany and we had been living overseas for all those years, I decided to invest in a long arm. And so I have a long arm quilt machine um, in person. I think that Peter will get the picture. We'll get a video of it later. But um, I have my quilt hanging up here and I've done the quilting on a few of them myself. I think I've done 
10 quilts so far um, on my own of doing the long arm and learning how to use machine rulers and things like that um, and also doing freehand. And so unfortunately, I don't utilize the quilter anymore because I have this long arm. Um, and so you have a photo of that uh, long arm. And um, one of the activities I wanted to do was just to kind of go over like color placements and color in quilts. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to, end, um, as I end my photo presentation, I did want to just kind of show, you know, a few pictures of um, our friends. And here's um, the right side is the photo. I think that might have been the very first time that I hand dyed the teak fabric. I did it multiple times um, over the years that we lived there. And so that was just such a great experience. And, you know, being able to find people that we sewed with and that we, um, we met weekly or maybe every couple of weeks, I think in Ghana we met and in Germany at the Quilt Guild I met, uh, you know, we met monthly. And so we got a couple pictures of my kids and, um, you know, just working on staying connected uh, culturally for them was really important for us over the years. Um, this is my final photo in the presentation. Is that on Zoom or it's not showing up? Yeah, something something happened. Showing up. Something happened. Um, let me see if I can share that a different way. I don't believe in, um, oh, I think it's like thinking about it. Sorry. I don't believe in perfection, especially as a quilter. I, nothing is perfect. I don't believe in perfection anywhere in life. Um, unfortunately, it's not showing you the screen, um, but I did match points on a star quilt one time, super good. So that was my last photo that I wanted to share, but for some reason it's not coming through there. <laughs> so, oh shoot, okay. Um, so yeah, so, you know, I think that the, one of the really important things that we can do as Native people is to just make sure that we continue to share things with people and that we um, are able to share those not only with our kids, but our friends and our relatives. And so here in person, I have, Peter, is it okay if I get up and move yeah. Okay. Um, I have some quotes that I made. And I think some of you guys were downstairs in the sewing, in the sewing guild. Mm -hmm. So then for this one, I have, um, I used a special ruler and I cut that strip of line on two sides. And then you just kind of mix it up. And this one is a layer cake. So this is a 10 inch fabric um, that comes in a pack of like 40. And so I use a special ruler for this one. Um, this one is one of my favorite quilt patterns of all time. It's called turning 20. So the 20 is how many pieces of fabric you need. And it uses um, a fat quarter. So you know a fat quarter is a quarter of a yard of fabric cut a certain way. And so this uses, you can see the big block. It ends up using 20 fat quarters and makes one block. And then it makes 20 blocks. So that's a pretty good size quilt for that one. Um, this one quilt right here with the kind of the chevrons. Um, this is my sister-in-law. So thank you, Tammy. <laughs> um, this one was a quilt kit. But again, you know, super easy. And this is not something that is really difficult or uh, it doesn't take special tools. This one does take the special ruler, but you know, these other ones are triangles and squares. Um, I, I use my time when I was in France to try new stuff, to try making more than only our star quotes that we, that we need. Um, I wanted to make sure that I wanted to try to test and see what I could produce. Um, I think over the years, I only made one thing that really did not come out well. <laughs> um, so I think that's a pretty good track record. Um, this is another star quilt that I made that's not like our star quilt. It's just big triangles. And this is actually vintage sheets, like old sheets. Um, and I think all of it is, and then there's just regular quilting fabric on the back, but you can see it's just big triangles. So it's not hard to do. It's really easy to make. Um, I really try to play with the, you know, talking about, if I talk about color again, I try to match the, like the plaid and the stripes to a floral that will go with them. 
And then I try to make them be across from each other, right? So then nothing is next to each other. It ends up looking really nice. Um, and then hanging up here are two quilts that I recently did last, I did them last summer. I did the quilting on them last summer. I don't know how long everybody, anybody online or anybody in person, how old is your oldest project? But I know that I have the blue one um, probably for about 15 years. <laughs> so, you know, the important part is to just make sure that you work on it at some point and finish it. Um, but I did the long arm quilting. Um, that was one of the first quilts that I did um, when I did the long arm. And I did that with rulers. I did that with only a couple different rulers. Um, and I used probably, I don't know how long that one took me. But then I also did the yellow one. The yellow one has blocks and then it has solid fabrics. And I did a different quilt design in each of the yellow blocks. And I did the same kind of squiggly line one in the, the floral blocks. Um, so for my activity, what I actually wanted to do is have everybody kind of look and see, look through the Lone Star Principle book. Um, this is the one that has multiple um, star quilt patterns in here. This is, it's a coloring page. Um, and so you can find this online. It is available for free online. I did not create this. Um, this woman named Harry created this. And so you saw the photo where my mom um, was one who, she uses the fabric. She uses fabric to do her pieces. Um, but I usually do uh, color pencils or I do, uh, on, I do it online. So there are some things online where you can do. So you can see online, Right here is the cover page for this. This is called the Lone Star Medallion ebook. It's a free ebook you can find online. Um, this is really great because this person has put together, I think there's six different sizes. Um, so if you're thinking, oh, I want to do a baby quilt or I want to do, you know, a queen size quilt, not only does she tell you how many diamonds you have, but she tells you, um, or so, excuse me, but it has a whole the entire image, so you can color in the entire thing versus just one diamond. So one of the things that I really like to think about and I like to focus on, let me share my screen one more time and we can go back to um, this color, the color issue. Um, I have that. I wish, I wish you could see my points because I was really hard with that. <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> really, I don't believe in perfection, but that was, I took a picture of it. So, um, so if you look at this here, I really, you know, I have critiqued myself. I have said like, oh, I don't like these two pinks and this other star quilt are too similar or something like that. But um, I think I have a really good eye for color. I usually um, manage to, you know, I, I have a good, I have a good eye for color. I pick out some nice things. Um, nice fabrics when it comes to the star quilts. And so you can see here that none of these in this particular star quilt, um, none of them are too similar. None of them are really close in shade. Um, when you're working with batiks, this might be the same line of fabrics. And so when you're working with batiks, I think it's really important to try to make sure that you have some contrast. Um, you can see some beautiful star quilts out there. I know a lot of people, um, I know my cousin Sammy Bordeaux makes beautiful star quilts. I know there's a lot of people that make really nice star quilts. And so you can always get inspired, um, you know, maybe not copy somebody fully. Be sure to make sure where you talk about where you found it. But, you know, if you look at these, you can see uh, how is this going to look? How is this going to be placed? Um, in person here, I know that we have some members of the sewing group that comes down, uh, that meets here at Racing Magpie. Um, so I think that the terminology is okay for them. But remember, if you have questions, just go ahead and ask. But making star quilts, there's a couple different methods that I'm aware of. One is sewing diamonds individually to each other, um, which on, I'm sorry, I don't do that. Um, the other is sewing strips of fabric together. And once they're all sewn together, as in, let me go back to this picture, um, I don't think you can, oh yeah, you can see my blue square. So I sew the strips here. So you can see this, that I have this 
uh, photo that shows all the strips that is sewn together. And that's what we're going to cut our diamonds out of. I know that there's a lot of other people out there who sew their diamonds together. Um, I did try that a couple different times. And honestly, it was kind of difficult for me. Um, and so I moved to this um, strip method. It's called the strip piecing method um, of sewing star quilts together. And I find that that works out just as well. It works out just as good um, to be able to do that. So when you're thinking of your colors, you want to make sure that you have um, some colors that really complement each other. You can find color wheels online. You know, there's a lot of color theory out there. Um, but I will tell you, I'm not sure if it's going to show up on screen. Um, what you can do is take a photo, and when you you when you look at your picture, edit it and change it to black and white. And then you can see, I might mess this up. I think you can see the tone. Is that right? You're going to see the tone of the picture, if that's the right language to use. But if you look at your photo in black and white, then you can see, oh, look, this whole little chunk here is all too dark and it's blending together. So maybe you want to swap those out. That's a real easy way. That's a real, you know, most of us have um, phones that have the camera on it. So you can use your camera um, that you already have to be able to look and kind of see how your fabrics are blending together and see how they're matching together. Um, and so one of the things that I always do is find a quilt build um, when I move somewhere new. You know, like I mentioned, relationships take work and friendships take work. Um, and so I try to find those people who I want to hang out with that are interested in doing the things that I like to do. I join the library, I find a book club, and I find a quilt guild. Um, and I recently moved to Montana and come to find out that there's actually four quilt guilds in the town that I'm in. So I hope that when the time comes for me to move again, I'm able to find um, those same people, find some like-minded people again. Um, I, I am still active online. I'm still active in the online modern quilt movement. Um, the modern quilt movement um, is really vibrant. They have uh, multiple, or they have a quilt show and they work, it's a quilt show and workshops um, once a year. Um, they just had it a couple weeks ago. Uh, I've never been able to attend because of living overseas. So I'm hoping to be able to go next year um, and attend that. But quilt guilds will often have um, presentations, you know, if you have questions, if you want to learn something, you should look that up wherever you live and see if there's somebody local. You know, if you're local to um, to Rapid City where Racing Magpie is, you can come over here. Um, I think that the sewing guild, uh, sewing group here meets and gets together and visits and sews together. Sounds like pretty regularly, so I think that's really just such a nice thing to be able to have access to. So, um, that's kind of it for my presentation. Um, Peter, if there's any questions or comments? Yeah, we've got one question on Facebook. Someone said, beautiful work. And then yeah. they said, do you prefer hand stitching or sewing over the sewing machine? Or the other way around? Um, I definitely, hand, I sew on the sewing machine all of my items together. I do hand sew finishing touches. For example, um, the stitching on the advent calendar. Um, and uh, hand binding. Usually, you you sew binding twice. You sh you sew it to the machine for to the quilt first, and then you turn it over and you finish it. Um, and so I I will only usually do hand binding hand sewing. Excuse me on something that I would consider like an accent. Um, I really admire people who do hand sewing. I know that I have star quilts um, that I received when I was younger. Um, that of course are in perfect condition still today with all, you know, decades worth of use that were hand sewn um, and hand stitched. And, you know, I know that that takes a lot of time and effort and I really appreciate people who do that. Um, but especially once I got my long arm quilt machine, I really look forward to using my long arm um, and being able to play around with the techniques and sewing that way. Um, even for like, you know, making the quilt itself, I have not hand sewn a quilt for probably Wow, I think my niece is 24, maybe. Um, and I did make her baby quilt um, hand sewing. I did embroider blocks and I hand sewed them together. I did not have a sewing machine at the time. Um, and my mom will be quick to tell you that she had to repair quite a few of those because I think my stitches were too big. They were too far apart. They were, you know, it was not nearly up to her standards um, for what this baby quilt should be. And I know my niece used it for quite a while and then it got put away. Um, I think it's still in pretty good condition. So my hand sewing back then and my mom's repair work on it um, has lasted over the years. 
that's everything online. Any questions here okay. in the room? Or comments? Yeah. Yards. How many yards would you use for the ultrafine and each color? So it depends on the quilt that you use, that you're making. So whenever you look up a pattern online, um, for example, the quilt, the quilt that I have that's the turning 20, um, that is 20 fat quarters. And you can buy the fat quarters like at Joann's or I think Walmart, if Walmart still sells fabric, they have um, fat quarters. So that particular pattern just only needs 20 fat quarters. Um, but star quilts, I think you end up, it depends on how many colors you want to do, um, how many diamonds you want to do for star quilts. Um, but the, the biggest, the biggest circle of diamonds, I think you end up needing like two and a half yards, um, depending on how big your diamonds are as well. But every quilt pattern, when you look at a quilt pattern, there's so many free quilt patterns online that are available. Any quilt pattern you look will tell you how much fabric you're going to need. It will tell you all the fabric the, for the top and for the back um, that you would need for that one. And so there are a lot of different ways you can buy fabric. You can buy um, pre-cut squares, pre-cut, um, I think they're making pre-cut rectangles now and in different sizes as well. So this quilt here that I mentioned needed a special ruler that was 10 inch squares that were pre-cut. And I just bought one pack. And so it comes with the pack. Um, it comes with 40 pieces, usually 40 pieces in that one. And so you're able to make a quilt with just those 40 pieces. Um, so it depends on the fact, it depends on the quilt pattern, but you can probably get like a throw size or a bed size quilt with, you know, maybe three or four yards, depending on what your, um, depending on what your pattern is going to be. Nothing else? Nothing else right now. No. So you all have some here. No. Well, thank you so much, Peter and Mary, for having me. Racing Mac, I really appreciate what you guys are doing here. I think this is awesome. I hope everybody had a, a good time. Let me try one more time and see if I can show you mine. Oh my goodness. Why is it full screen and then share it? Maybe. Let me try to. Yeah. There were a couple that didn't show up. Oh, they didn't? Okay, sorry about that. I was looking at my computer. Yeah. So, um, and then what did you say? If I just do, oh, you know what? Let me share my screen, just my screen. Does that, does that work? It's working on my screen right now. I don't see it. Online, you can see it. Can you yeah. see the orange? Yeah. yeah <laughs> okay, so there you go. <laughs> So there is, like I said, I do not believe in perfection in any in anything. Um, in quilting, you're gonna make mistakes everywhere. You're gonna make mistakes everywhere. You're gonna cut something wrong. One time I cut something in centimeters instead of inches. You know, <laughs> you're gonna mess up. I went to bed after that. So, but you can see, you can see that this. I'll I'll turn my camera and show um, everybody here afterwards. But this uh, this is the closest I've ever come to. That's perfection right there. So, <laughs> right. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you to everyone online. We're going to shut down here and keep going in person for a few more minutes. We'll see you at the next winter camp.